Before we begin, I'd like to reiterate that the content of this briefing is on, the, while it's on the record, it's under embargo, and the embargo will be lifted tomorrow, the 23rd of June at 1 p.m. Central European Summer Time. Um, I'm Jill Ford, I'm Head of Communications here at the BIS, and with me to answer your questions are Economic Advisor and Head of Research, Hyun Thong Shin, and the Head of the BIS, Innovation Hub, Benoit Carré. I'll hand over now to Hyun and Benoit for some short opening remarks. Thank you, Jill, uh, and uh, uh, welcome everyone to this media briefing. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this chapter examines how central bank digital currencies, uh, or CBDCs, can contribute to a safe and open monetary system that supports innovation and serves the public interest. Um, as central bank money, CBDCs would preserve the core features of money that only the central bank can provide, uh, anchored in the foundation of trust in the central bank itself. But uh, as we say in the chapter, putting the idea into practice entails a number of uh, design choices that will determine the broader impact on the financial system. Uh, the chapter sets out uh, these design choices and asks what uh, CBDCs would mean for users, financial intermediaries, central banks, and the international monetary system. The design choices will have implications for the competitive structure of the financial system, as well as for data privacy and data governance uh, more broadly. The chapter emphasizes how CBDCs build on the tried and tested technology that the latest generation of conventional retail fast payment systems uh, have relied on. So in this sense, uh, CBDCs uh, represent an evolution rather than something totally different. Let me hand over to my colleague, Bernard Corre, uh, head of the BIS Innovation Hub, for a few words uh, on what the chapter has to say on the practicalities of CBDCs. Thank you, Hyun. So um, in this chapter, we put forward the, uh, the case that uh, CBDCs are, would best function uh, as part of a two-tier system where the uh, central bank and the private sector uh, would work together to do what uh, each does well. So how does it look like? The central bank would operate the core of the system and ensure, and, and ensure its safety uh, and efficiency, while the private sector, uh, such as banks and payment service providers, uh, would use uh, its innovative capacity to serve uh, customers. And, uh, and we, we believe that from a practical perspective, the most promising CBDC design uh, would be one tied to a digital identity, uh, requiring users to identify themselves uh, to access funds. And um, we, do, we, we believe that, that the design can be uh, carefully uh, thought through uh, as a way to balance protecting users against the abuse of personal data with protecting the payment system against money laundering and financial crime. So, done right, CBDC could form the backbone of a new uh, digi digital payment system uh, by enabling broad access, uh, providing strong data governance uh, and privacy standards. And that's the best way to promote the public interest case for digital money. I stop here. Thank you very much, Benoit. So we now open uh, to questions. So before we start, just a reminder for those of you who've joined us slightly late that uh, this briefing is on the record. Uh, however, it's embargoed until tomorrow at 1 p.m. Uh, that's Tuesday, the 23rd of June, Central European time. So I think you know the usual uh, for, for dialing, for asking your questions. So can you either put your question in the chat raise your hand and you can also email press at bis.org. Um, if you can also indicate who your question is for, that would be very helpful as well. So I look first to see if anyone has a raised hand or uh, questions in the chat. So, so the first question is from Jacques Schickler from MLEX. Jack, please put in your question. We can hear you. Thanks. Um, a, a slightly technical question, but one of the issues raised in the article is, is programmability, uh, which is the ability for central banks to or users to decide how a specific bit of payment can then be used so you can kind of control the onward use even after you've made a payment. Um, that's obviously quite a useful technical feature in some respects for smart contracts and so on, but uh, at some point, it stops looking like money because it's no longer something that you can use universally and, and uniformly. 
um, you know, does that create a problem for the nature of money? And does does a programmable currency is that really a currency at all? Um, thanks, Jack, for that question. I think, in a way, uh, programmable money is a kind of oxymoron, um, in that uh, you know, money is meant to be, uh, you know, invariant to um, it. It has to be something that has. Uh, a known value um, in all states of the world. Um, you know, you can uh, uh, incorporate features that uh, um, uh, that um, change the nature of the claim uh, to how the world evolves, but that's more like a voucher. Uh, so I think the, the main point to say uh, is that uh, programmability is neither necessary, uh, so, so it's not a necessary feature of a CBDC, of course, you can incorporate uh, programmability into programmability into digital claims, uh, but uh, it's probably not the most important feature, and certainly not necessary uh, for a CBDC. If I um, ju just to add a word to what uh, to Anne Hyun just said, um, programmability probably has a very different uh, uh, significance uh, whether. Uh, it comes to wholesale central bank digital currency or retail or central bank digital currency. Uh, wholesale central bank digital currency is already uh, purpose specific in some aspects. So if you imagine, for instance, a central bank token being sent on a, on a blockchain as a way to settle uh, tokenized assets, which is exactly what we've been uh, looking into uh, under the uh, Elvetia project in the, in the Swiss center of the innovation, of the innovation hub. Um, then uh, smart contracts can go a long way towards uh, uh, facilitating the settlement cycle of the of the asset, uh, and that's where programmable money can be very useful. Uh, programmable money for retail use goes into all the uh, difficulties that were highlighted by Hune, so it's a different discussion. Thank you very much. The next question is from Martin Sanbu of the Financial Times. Martin, if you want to... Yes, we to unmute. Um, <laughs> unmute. Uh, good. Hello, and uh, thanks for hosting us. Um, nice to see you, and thanks for doing this. Um, it, it's two questions, if I may. Uh, one is sort of very broad brush, broad brush uh, question. It seems to me that the, the, the chapter makes a big step from purely a purely analytical approach to actually recommending uh, an approach. It, I mean, I read it as the BIS now saying a CBDC, yes, it's a good idea. Central banks should think about putting it in place and also make some recommendations in terms of the direction of design, although you, you leave very open to national differences and so on. But I, I just want to hear from you if it's fair to say that you have made that step now and there are recommendations at those two levels. The second question is related. Uh, the design that it seems like you recommend is, uh, as, a, as a report uh, describes in some detail, linked to digital identity. I mean, there are countries, and I'm not talking about uh, non-democracies here, I'm talking about democracies that don't have digital identities and, and in fact have some way to go to have sort of proper national identity schemes in the first place. I, I'm calling in from London. The UK has some philosophical issues about national ID cards, for example, that's been a long debate. The US doesn't have a very good unified ID system as it is. Uh, so are you, uh, you know, is this a bit of a European approach <laughs> to put it that way? How does this kind of, uh, how does, how does your design recommendation fit with countries that uh, actually even before we talk about CBDC or the monetary system uh, have struggled a bit with how they do national identity systems in the first place? Thank you very much. So let me uh, let, let me start with your uh, with with your questions, Martin. On, on, on the first one, yes, this chapter is uh, is positive about CBDCs and uh, and uh, and going into uh, into the uh, the uh, the nitty gritty of uh, of uh, CBDC design and uh, and a number of other details. Uh, now, uh, it's not that we are that we are getting carried uh, away by the discussion. We are just looking around us. Uh, our, our latest survey um, um, among central banks 
showed that 85% of central banks are studying CBDC and 60% of them are even um, uh, working on uh, on prototypes or, 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 uh, or proofs of concepts. Um, so uh, the train has left the station, right? Um, so it's not the BIS uh, leading the train, it's the central banking community uh, that collectively uh, is now uh, taking the CBDC discussion uh, much more seriously and practically than uh, even uh, when uh, one year ago or two years ago. Um, maybe, Hyun, you want to... Uh, take yeah, thanks, there? Martin, and, uh, uh, and thanks for joining us today. Um, uh, I think on, the, um, on your first question on, uh, on, the, on the broad thrust uh, of the chapter, um, I think by virtue of the fact that we're going into some of the details, it does come across, uh, I think, uh, much more as a, uh, as a practical sort of manual. Um, uh, uh, but as you say, we're not uh, um, having a blanket recommendation in this chapter. Um, it is very much a choice for the jurisdiction. And I think uh, um, it depends very much on the, lo the local circumstances, uh, you know, whether you would really benefit from a CBDC. I think, uh, you know, we, um, uh, you know, when we consider, for example, uh, the, the nature of the competitive landscape in some countries, uh, you know, how large are your big techs in your economy? How large are the, um, the uh, uh, if you like, the, 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 the um, competitive uh, uh, issues that have to do with uh, the concentration of data? Um, uh, how large are the issues to do with data privacy and data governance? I think um, these questions will affect countries in a different, um, uh, and in different ways. So, um, uh, I think it's fair to say, as, uh, as Benoit has just said, that uh, uh, in a broad sense, we're seeing a kind of time trend where the issues to do with uh, competition and data privacy that all flow from the importance of data in the digital economy is taking much more of a center stage. So it's not a surprise that uh, 56 central banks have actually announced publicly that they are actually conducting some sort of study uh, or indeed uh, kind of development. Um, so I think uh, I will stop there for the first question. On, this, on your second question about national ID, um, I think it's important to, um, to underline that uh, digital ID doesn't mean necessarily a national ID system. Uh, in fact, we have a pretty long discussion in the chapter about the whole spectrum of different uh, digital ID systems, you know, starting from the ID systems that uh, individual big tech uh, firms actually provide, um, you know, like, uh, you know, you have your, your Apple ID, you have your Google ID and so on. Um, and then there are different uh, combinations where you, you can see um, private sector firms coming together as a consortium and having some kind of common private ID system. Or you could have something that involves uh, the, the official sector in a more, um, uh, you know, guiding um, uh, uh, sort of input um, to the other end of the uh, spectrum, which is a fully um, uh, government-issued uh, state ID system. Uh, so those are, you know, different ways of providing ID. So uh, um, the account-based system that has a real name attached to the account, that does not necessarily mean that you have to adopt um, a, a government ID system at all. Uh, so it's compatible as long as we can actually have a good sense of, um, you know, who the individuals are so that we can ensure the integrity of the system in terms of the KYC and the, uh, and the anti-money laundering, um, you know, principles. Um, I think that's, yeah. So, Jill, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. And um, the next question is from um, Mark Rendell of The Globe and Mail. Mark, if you want to call in your question. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can, perfectly. Fantastic. Thank you for taking the question and thank you for doing this. Um, I'm wondering as the, these discussions have shaped up over the last year or two and, and become more serious, as you were saying, in the central banking community, um, what kind of feedback there's been from commercial banks in this process and whether there is pushback and concerns about the introduction of, of digital currencies and the, the kind of credit creation process. And I'm wondering if there's aspects of the architecture that you were suggesting in this chapter um, that's there to, to address any concerns that could be about disruptions to, you know, typical credit intermediation and creation. 
So maybe I can start, and uh, I'm sure Bernard wants to also come in on this one. Um, the, uh, I think one of the very important principles we, uh, we emphasize in the chapter is uh, uh, the fact that the central bank should um, and can maintain a relatively small footprint in the, in the financial system uh, with a CBDC. And the, um, and the goal here would be to have uh, a digital form of cash um, in a way that uh, preserves the fairly small footprint of cash itself in the, in the financial system. So cash typically is a very small fraction of the, of the deposits uh, in the banking system. And certainly the intention um, and, the, uh, and the design should uh, uh, try and aim for uh, the appropriate division of labor between the central bank and the commercial banks and other uh, private sector institutions. And certainly uh, it should not, uh, the design uh, should not um, disrupt the, uh, the smooth flow of credit in the economy. Um, so uh, that does actually get into some of the, uh, some of the design features we are actually um, uh, outlining um, those design features, which are, you know, most likely the most conducive to having a small footprint. Um, uh, and so there are various sort of technical features like, uh, you know, the, the, the way you update the ledger, uh, how you involve the private sector uh, intermediaries and in all of uh, um, uh, the operation, the detailed operation of the system. I think, uh, you know, one point that is really worth emphasizing is that the technology that's uh, behind uh, some of the well-known uh, and well-discussed designs of CBDCs are already pretty well known from the latest generation of uh, retail fast payment systems, and this have and these have to do with, for example, these uh, application programming interfaces, you know, APIs, which give ownership of the data to the users. Uh, but then there is a uh, set of technical standards that allow uh, intermediaries to, you know, have justifiable access to uh, pieces of the data that are absolutely necessary for, you know, some uh, transactions. Um, so that's a kind of way of uh, having the data governance framework that ticks the the competitive, um, uh, you know, uh, imperatives as well as the uh, the broader uh, data privacy imperatives as well. Um, and and I think the uh, you know just to just to emphasise uh, this kind of rollout should be done with very much the private sector. Uh, as the partners, because they'll be essential um, in uh, making any uh, any system like this uh, uh, functional. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> CBDC is not a uh, is not a transformation project for the financial system. Uh, CBDC is a way to first uh, make sure that uh, central banks can uh, keep delivering on their core missions in a uh, digital world, and that is. Uh, monetary stability and financial stability. Uh, and second, uh, it's about uh, making sure that in this new digital world, the financial system will, will remain competitive and open. Uh, and so the counterfactual is not about comparing CBDC, a, wor a world with CBDC with uh, the payment world as it is today. Uh, the, the counterfactual, it's about comparing a world with CBDC with uh, possible scenarios without CBDC, uh, where payments uh, and money will get to be dominated by uh, very big players uh, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with market power. So big tech companies, for instance. Uh, and that's a place where you don't want to be. That's a place where governments don't want to be, because it's about the sovereignty of money. And uh, I would say that's a place where commercial bonds don't want to be either because uh, the, uh, the system has to remain competitive and open. And so CBDC is really the, uh, the backbone, the cornerstone of a, uh, of a vision of the payment system, uh, which has to be uh, competitive and open, and, uh, and where central bank money uh, as a neutral uh, settlement asset and means of payment will be at the center. Thank you very much. We have a question in um, in written form, which is it relates to the, to these questions. So it's from Mark Jones in in Reuters. And are the major central banks working together enough on the rules around CBDCs? And then the second question he has is: What are the two main issues around retail CBDCs that still need to be agreed globally? So maybe suggest Benoit takes question one and and, and Hugh in question two. <laughs> So 
So yes, uh, central banks are talking a lot <laughs> about CBDC together. Um, um, and, uh, and the BIS uh, is at the center of it, uh, both in terms of, uh, of the policy discussion around CBDC and in terms of the technical discussion about uh, solutions that, that can be uh, provided to, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the problem statements that, that all central banks are, are putting forward. Uh, and that are related to all the questions you've already asked in terms of the architecture, the uh, the, uh, the privacy solutions, uh, the, the safeguards for the for commercial banks, and so on and so forth. So there are lots of questions that central banks are asking themselves, uh, and uh, and that they want to solve uh, together. So the BIS Innovation Hub is at the center of that. Uh, we are uh, working on a number of CBDC projects uh, that will uh, help uh, uh, central banks answer these questions. Uh, we've started what we call the, the BIS uh, Innovation Network, which gathers all our 63 members of the BIS. Uh, and the BIS Innovation Network has a working group on, uh, on uh, uh, CBDC. Um, and, um, and we are uh, discussing CBDC, particularly the, uh, the global implications of CBDC or the cross-border implication of, uh, implications of CBDC. Uh, as part of the uh, G20 uh, action plan on cross-border payments, uh, which uh, which has uh, 19 building blocks, as you may know, and building block 19 is uh, precisely about the international dimension of CBDC, and it's uh, it's being led by the Committee for Payments and Market Infrastructures, and by the BIS uh, Innovation Hub. So that's a place where we discuss the um, international implications of what we're all doing. Yes, and Mark, and uh, uh, I think your second question was about the um, the uh, design issues around retail CBDCs um, uh, that has to be agreed globally. Uh, so I guess, you know, uh, when you refer to global agreement, you have in mind some kind of uh, interoperability between CBDC systems. And I, I suppose this is where, uh, you know, this is very much an extension of what uh, Benoit has just described. Uh, where uh, um, uh, the set of international standards, uh, you know, could facilitate uh, you know greater uh, cross-border use uh, or uh, interoper the interoperability of the standards uh, of the systems, uh, you know, more broadly. Um, I think the um, uh, the big design issues are the ones that uh, Benoit has already mentioned in his opening remarks. Um, I think one. Uh, important fork in the road is whether you go for a system that's based on uh, uh, real identity, so a form of digital ID of some kind, versus something that is a token-based system, which is uh, uh, something that just relies on your private key, um, uh, uh, just your password, rather than uh, uh, having to uh, uh, base the uh, the membership of the network on your on your real ID. Uh, so 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 somewhat like the cryptocurrency uh, uh, way of uh, um, uh, operating. I think the consensus is that for, uh, the, for the system to work uh, while preserving the integrity of the system, uh, while at the same time preserving some degree of anonymity and, uh, and, and data privacy, that uh, uh, matching it to a data uh, matching it to a digital ID system um, is the better way to go. And uh, I think this is one of the, um, uh, the main conclusions of the chapter. Um, the, um, I think the other uh, um, set of issues have to do with what is the relationship between the central bank and the, um, the commercial banks and other payment service providers. And uh, we list a, a different, um, a whole range of different ways of interacting going from uh, a model where the central bank does everything, which we think is not a good idea, to one where the central bank uh, purely takes the wholesale balances that the, uh, that the commercial banks and, um, and other payment service providers provide. Um, and there are ways of um, uh, finding middle grounds there where uh, there is a better uh, grasp of the data governance uh, while uh, delegating most of the operational tasks uh, to the to the private sector institutions there as well. So I guess you know those are the two main issues uh, of what is the sort of foundational um, uh, uh, you know way of uh, um, you know transacting, and the second is what is exactly the relationship uh, that we envisage between the central bank and the and the private sector institutions. Um, 
and uh, um, and there could be more. So, um, <clears throat> if if I may, I just wanted to uh, to emphasize uh, very strongly uh, that uh, international cooperation on CBDC is essential, and that's what we're doing here at the BIS. Uh, why is it essential? Because that's about the functioning of the global monetary system. And uh, we don't want CBDC to add to fragmentation in the, in the international monetary system. Um, and it's not a given. All CBDC projects come from a domestic conversation on uh, you know, how do citizens want to, uh, to see uh, money and payments evolve. And that has to be domestic, because these are, this is a discussion about sovereign money. And it is shaped by uh, by legal uh, considerations, um, so it's not it's not a given that all these, these conversations will meet anywhere. Uh, and second, uh, it is also shaped by technological considerations. And as the IMF uh, has recently written, uh, the new trade wars are technology wars. So we don't want CBDC to be caught uh, in the uh, in the crosshairs of, of of technology wars. Uh, and that that's why it's so important that uh, that discussion uh, takes place at a global level and the BIS will be at the center of it. Thanks very much. Um, we have a next question uh, to come in over the phone from Angela Howe from Sina. Angela, can you come in with your question? And thank you for waiting. Uh, <laughs> thank you. So can you hear me now? Perfectly. Uh, perfect. Okay, I have two questions. The first question is, Based on your analysis, what kind of role China will play in this global trend of CBDCs? As we know, China are quite advanced in digital payment system, including a well-functioned national-wide digital ID system. Do you think that can give China some kind of leverage or advantage on promoting this CBDC, CBCDs, CBDCs? Okay, the second question actually is not directly linked to the CBDC is about, as you might already know, China has put a lot of restrictions on cryptocurrencies recently, Bitcoin in particular. Do you think tightening restrictions on cryptocurrencies will be a global phenomenon for central banks? Are cryptocurrencies a real threat to central banks? Thank you. Thanks very much, I think. Um... Jen, do you want to I take think, the first uh, Jill, I think uh, yeah. I could take the first one, and Benoit can take the second okay, one. Um, so, Angela, thank you for that question. I think that, um, so China has been uh, one of the leaders in uh, the development of uh, uh, CBDCs. Um, it, I think, reflects very much the, uh, um, the domestic situation where the, uh, as I was referring earlier, uh, you know, when you have a payments market um, which is prone to concentration with the concentration of data and so on. Uh, the public interest is best served if you have an open platform um, that is more conducive to uh, to uh, competition and, uh, and, and the data governance. Uh, and I think China's um, uh, leadership in developing the, uh, uh, the cutting edge uh, technology and systems for CBDC is very much uh, you know, can be understood in that context. Um, on the international dimension, um, as Benoit was saying, I think international cooperation is very important uh, to preserve uh, an open um, international monetary architecture. Um, the um, uh, the cross border use of CBDCs, uh, um, I think, you know, can be. Um, uh, can be undertaken through monetary cooperation, and uh, you know our view is that uh, uh, the the unwanted spread of a foreign CBDC in one's own jurisdiction uh, is less of a danger when uh, the CBD uh, the CBDC itself uh, is based on a digital ID design, uh, because then the issuing central bank will have a lot of uh, uh, control over uh, the membership of that uh, of that network. And the host jurisdiction uh, will also have a lot of uh, leverage in um, in how the CBDC is actually used. Um, so I think with that, maybe we can address the cryptocurrency question. Just maybe one more one more note on our, on China and CBDC. I mean, we are uh, cooperating uh, very closely with the People's Bank of China uh, on the ground. Um, 
and in particular, uh, the, uh, the PBOC's uh, Digital Currency Institute uh, is a, a partner of the BIS Innovation Hub as part of the uh, so-called MCBDC pro Bridge Project, the Multiple CBDC Bridge Project, um, which was uh, started in uh, between the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and the Bank of Thailand, and uh, which we are now uh, leading together with our uh, HKMA, Bank of Thailand, uh, PBOC, and the uh, Central Bank of the United Arab Emirates. So we are, we have uh, we have very close cooperation with uh, with China on these uh, on these issues, and in particular on the international dimension of CBDC. Um, on your second question, I mean we've noted the actions taken by the Chinese authorities uh, regarding uh, Bitcoin mining and trading uh, in the in the country, uh, but uh, as uh, I guess we've said repeatedly. Uh, on, well, and, and that's on top of the excessive energy uh, used to mean uh, to mine uh, Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is more of a speculative asset than uh, than money, uh, and it has uh, certainly failed the, uh, the test of becoming a means of payment. Thank you very much, Benoit. Um, again, this was another. I think is a, a caller again. So I, Li Wei Wang from Kai Xin. Li Wei, do you want to call in your question? Can you hear me? Yep, perfect. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, uh, two questions also dig deeper on, on China. Uh, so, uh, as you described in the chapter, and uh, for us who follows uh, CBDC, we know very well uh, the case for CBDC for central banks and for financial stability. But for laymen, um, their case for them, especially in countries like China or say Hong Kong, it seems less so. Hong Kong has this fast payment system, as Hyun mentioned. Uh, China, we have Alipay and WeChat, which technologically speaking, they are very advanced and very uh, easy to use. Uh, so what would you say uh, to, say, Chinese or Hong Kong uh, kind of uh, typical people on the street to encourage them to use CBDCs? Should they take a longer term perspective uh, rather than just taking the present kind of ease of use uh, perspective. Uh, and second, relating to the MCBDC, um, I understand the goal is to uh, exchange uh, these four currencies uh, with ease and, and use eventually as it, if it's their own currency. Uh, but what if uh, uh, for some country like China, there is still capital controls? Does this... Uh, it is still an obstacle for this goal to uh, kind of uh, realize. And also, I noted in your sec uh, in your chapter, you mentioned uh, uh, central bank uh, takes on an operational role, role in FX conversion. Is it related to th this point? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Li Wei. There's a lot of questions in there, so um, maybe we might start with the, the first one uh, and, and Hyun about, I suppose, the, the layman case for the people on the street. Yes, uh, thank you, Li Wei, for that question. Um, you know, as you say, many countries already have a very well-functioning retail fast payment system uh, that is built on this open architecture uh, where users have control over the data and uh, the other private sector players uh, uh, play by the rules in terms of uh, um, the, the data governance that uh, uh, promotes a more competitive um, uh, uh, and in some ways a more innovative um, uh, set of operations. Uh, I think, uh, as you say, the, the context in China is different in that you have uh, these two very large uh, digital payment providers, uh, and so the starting point is different. And so the rationale uh, for CBDCs um, it is very different in China. Um, I think the point to make is that uh, the, of course, you know, the convenience for the everyday user is very important. And any system, uh, something that's based on CBDCs, should also um, aim to provide uh, that great deal of convenience. Um, I think the the point to emphasize is the importance on, uh, of interoperability, that uh, the system should be such that you're not um, uh, in a closed network where uh, your transactions are uh, you know, uh, only with the members of that 
particular closed network, uh, somewhat like a silo or a walled garden uh, in the way that we write in the chapter. But it should be something which is system-wide um, and it should be an open system. And that the, um, the, the experience of many countries, um, I think, shows that uh, if you have an open system, uh, that is much more conducive to uh, a more efficient and cost-effective system. But um, it's also something which is quite compatible and indeed uh, something which does encourage uh, the innovation that allows um, the firms to serve customers better. So in that respect, I think for the long term, um, uh, of course, you know, the, the system should be such that um, the users uh, feel, uh, the users can see the benefits of using such an open system in terms of lower costs and better services. So, um, yeah, um, on the um, uh, on your second question, Li Wei, on the uh, on the MCVDC bridge, um, China having capital controls is actually an opportunity for us. It's interesting. Uh, it's something that we want to look uh, to look into. And why is it important for us to um, to bring that to uh, to the experiment, to the uh, to the prototype? Because the um, the heart of the discussion on the international dimension of CBDC is whether CBDC um, will um, infringe uh, on, uh, on a country's sovereignty, both monetary sovereignty, that is the ability to set monetary policy, um, and, uh, and financial sovereignty, which includes the ability to enforce capital controls. Uh, and so uh, it's a... Uh, it's an essential contribution. It's, it's it's an it's it's an important contribution to the international discussion to be sh to to check whether and how, and under which parameters and which technology, um, uh, CBDCs can be interoperable while uh, preserving the ability of countries to uh, to uh, implement capital controls, and the uh, the IMF also will be of course uh, uh, interested uh, uh, in our conclusions. So, uh, so that that makes the experiment more more useful in a sense to have this diversity of uh, of, uh, of starting points. Um, on your second question, which is about ethics conversion, uh, here I would say that the jury is uh, is, is out uh, whether uh, multiple CBDC platforms will have the ethics conversion uh, functionality inside the platform or outside of the platform. So we want to look into it. Uh, we probably want to test both options uh, and compare, uh, but it's too early to conclude. Thank you very much. Um, the next question comes from Sari, and I'm just trying to find your, your name, Sari Kajihara from yes. NHK. Can, can you come in with your question? I hope my pronunciation of your name was okay. Thank you. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for kindly taking my questions. Uh, I've got one question about uh, El Salvador government decision to de define Bitcoin as a fiat legal currency. Uh, what do you think about this move uh, in relation to this report, which says that cryptocurrencies are not very suitable for reliable settlements? Uh, do we have do we have to something to do before other developing country get get interested in accepting bitcoin as a field are you are you going to uh, take examination or get some feedback from them that's my question thank you thank you sorry i think you're slightly outside the parameters of, uh, of of the report here but i think maybe we could try and answer the i suppose the second part of your question rather than the the specifics of any jurisdiction please uh Hyun. yes uh thank you jill uh and thank you sorry for the question as as jill said um uh, uh we don't comment on individual jurisdictions uh but as as uh, benoit laid out uh, earlier um uh i think Bitcoin and other similar cryptocurrencies have not uh, proved uh, to be very useful uh, means of uh, payments. Uh, and in that sense, uh, you know, they are, if anything, more of a, uh, uh, a uh, speculative asset rather than uh, money. And, um, uh, you know, we do have a very short discussion of this in the chapter. The, the chapter is not about cryptocurrencies. Uh, it, is, it is about CBDCs. But we do have a very short discussion where we also point out that given the uh, the very uh, um, 
the very large you know energy footprint that uh, Bitcoin itself has that it has uh, you know very few redeeming um, uh, public good uh, you know attributes. Um, but I think that's probably uh, enough to be said on that, Jill. I think so. Um, and maybe a related question that, that comes in from Natalie Olof Ors from Agence France Press. Um, she, she says, over the last year, the boom of cryptocurrency has raised questions about consumer protection. So she asks, is there a sense of urgency from central banks in the idea of pushing towards a retail CBDC? Um, she asks the question, when would it be realistic um, to see retail CBDC arrive on the market? And then other supplementary questions, what should be the main function of retail CBDC, be it digital payment, savings, cross-border transfer, um, and uh, I suppose um, the, the payments back to families, etc. cetera. Um, so maybe I could direct this question to Renoir, please. Well, if, if there is a sense of urgency um, on uh, on central bank side when it comes to uh, to CBDC, uh, that sense of urgency doesn't come from the uh, from crypt from cryptocurrencies. The sense of urgency comes from the uh, emergence uh, of uh, uh, of global stable coins as a possible uh, payment option, and uh, and comes from the uh, entry of uh, big tech uh, companies in the in the payment market that has really uh, changed the uh, the prospects uh, and uh, and raised the prospect of uh, of very significant uh, changes in the world of payments, and that's what started the whole discussion back in uh, in two thousand nineteen. Uh, now, does it mean that uh, central banks are going to uh, hastily uh, 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 rush and uh, and uh, and uh, and bring forward their, their efforts to do CBDC? Not necessarily so. Uh, because uh, they want CBDC to be to be to be resilient, uh, they want it to be accepted, they want it to fit uh, social preferences. Um, when it comes to privacy, for instance, it's very obvious from the uh, discussion that the um, uh, that the um, they, they, they are, there are there are strong preferences for for privacy, and uh, and that has to be addressed and and embedded uh, in the into CBDC architecture. Uh, and that's what exactly what we're discussing in the chapter. Uh, and so there are lots of boxes to be ticked before uh, CBDC can go live, and central bankers will not uh, will not rush uh, before they can uh, they can offer a uh, a design and and a product which is uh, which is hundred percent safe for for citizens. So um, um, yeah. So um, if there is a the only the only the only caveat here is that you need some kind of a forward looking vision of how cbdc will fit uh with our uh, commercial means of payments including stable coins uh you need to look through it and you need to you need to uh you need to have this long term vision of a world where cbdc will be at the center and then you will have all kind of new uh, private means of payment around it Including stable coins, new interfaces, mobile payments, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so that that path, the path towards uh, this uh, uh, this uh, this new world has has to be outlined. But CBDC itself will come live only when it's ready and, and fit for purpose. I would say. Okay, I'm just look, making sure we get all of the questions. I think the the last few were coming in. Um, I think I missed earlier on Karen Young from the, the South China Post, um, South China Morning Post. Could you explain the potential of the multiple CBDC integration model? For example, could it facilitate the digital bat be converted to digital yuan or into digital Hong Kong dollar in the future? And what are the benefits and challenges for countries to join their systems to do this? Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Benoit? Okay. So there, there, there are different ways to um, to make um, to make a world with uh, with different CBDCs uh, function uh, smoothly. Uh, one model, um, which uh, uh, your your uh, your question is about, is uh, about having platforms, multiple CBDC platforms, uh, where C where CBDCs can be um, uh, settled uh, against each other. Um, Another possible model um, is one where uh, different uh, payment systems, national payment systems would be 
uh, interoperable, that is, would be based on uh, on uh, on common standards, but not necessarily with uh, uh, with uh, with bridges be being built uh, between them. So, so there are different models, and we've discussed that in a uh, in a recent uh, uh, BIS uh, working paper. So I can I can uh, I can uh, refer to that. Um, so the the MCBDC platform approach is one where uh, the um, the uh, exchange and settlement of different CBDCs are uh, brought together on the, on the same platform. And uh, here, the key advantage is about the uh, is about streamlining the uh, the number of possible transactions. Uh, uh, if you have a, if you have a, a large number of uh, of, the, of CBDCs uh, in the global economy, uh, then you have. Uh, an even larger number of possible transactions between uh, different uh, couples of CBDCs, um, n times n minus one over two, I guess. Uh, and uh, and if you want to uh, if you want to make this faster to streamline this, uh, it makes a lot of sense to bring the, the transactions on a single platform, uh, where uh, possibly also with a uh, with a single settlement asset uh, that would be used in the uh, in the platform. To uh, to reduce the number of possible transactions, so that's what that's why there, there is no answer yet uh, to these questions. Uh, that's uh, what we're looking into in the MCBDC bridge project in Hong Kong, uh, and also as far as the, as the BIS Innovation Hub is uh, is concerned, in another project that we are developing in our uh, in our Singapore Centre project Dunbar, which also uh, looks at uh, different ways to uh, to connect uh, uh, different CBDCs. there are any other questions and um, we still have a short amount of time please raise your hand if you have another question email us at press at bis.org um, or put your question into the chat any other questions any other questions okay Okay, there's a hand raised. Let me just check who that is. Uh, Bjork Smith, um, please, Smithmeyer, please um, ask your question. Thank you very much. Yeah, cheers, thanks. Um, this uh, this actually just sort of goes on from what it was that uh, Benoit and Juan were just talking about now in terms of energy consumption on on Bitcoin, uh, and, and don't worry, I'm not going to get into Bitcoin here, but just it's an interesting point that you raise because it's actually a debate that is happening in the European Parliament uh, as well as to whether there should be certain limitations on how much energy use uh, stable coins or crypto assets uh, should actually generate. Uh, and I'm just wondering, I, I know you touch on this um, in your chapter, but you don't obviously go into too much detail about it, but but I'm just curious to know what, what is your position on just uh, how much energy uh, crypto assets should actually generate and how much climate change should actually factor into this. Thank you. Um, Jill, maybe I can take that. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so, um, um, so Pirk, I think the, uh, what I would do is just to refer you to our previous uh, work on this. Uh, uh, three years ago, our annual economic report had a special chapter on, uh, on cryptocurrencies. Um, I mean, this year's report is not about that, and we only have a very short discussion. Uh, but if you go back to that older discussion, um, we laid out uh, uh, a few of the, um, uh, I think, you know, pretty compelling reasons why why cryptocurrencies could not serve as money. Uh, one was the fact that it's not scalable. Um, it has this feature that uh, the uh, the blockchain can get very congested uh, when there are more users, so that um, uh, you know, whereas money would typically have a network effect where uh, the more users flock to a particular platform, the more users want to go to that platform. So you have this virtuous circle in a uh, blockchain-based system, and in particular for Bitcoin, which has a pretty limited uh, you know, block size, you have uh, the opposite problem where you have congestion. And so if many people use it, uh, you would not want to use that. Your, your incentive to use it, uh, you know, falls. And, uh, and the transaction costs also go up. There's also an issue to do with the finality of payments and that uh, in any kind of blockchain uh, system with a decentralized, um, uh, with a decentralized uh, um, system of 
uh, of, uh, of governance, a uh, decentralized system um, of, um, uh, of confirming the transactions. You can never be sure that uh, a payment has actually, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, reached finality as it were, so that you can plan ahead. And uh, the uh, the energy use, um, which is common with all the cryptocurrencies that that uses a proof of work uh, system, um, is that uh, it, it's it's there primarily as a device uh, to maintain this decentralized uh, you know system. Um, of um, uh, of maintaining the ledger, and uh, in that sense, it is it is a very wasteful system. Uh, of uh, uh, it, it it purely serves the purpose of uh, you know maintaining this decentralized consensus, um, uh, and um, this is why you know what what we say in the chapter is that not only does it fail to serve uh, the function of money, um, given its energy. Uh, profile as well. Um, it has very few redeeming, you know, public good features. Yeah, just just maybe as a as a as a footnote to uh, to what Hyun just said, uh, and looking uh, looking uh, looking ahead, uh, if if you try to think of uh, of uh, what would be the possible carbon footprint of a of a of a central bank digital currency. Uh, in all possible scenarios, it's going to be much less than Bitcoin. Um, either it will be account-based, um, as suggested in the in the chapter, and then it, the carbon footprint will will be clo very close to uh, that of uh, existing payment systems. Uh, or and even if it's uh, uh, based on a on a token on a blockchain, uh, it's very likely to be based on a proof of stake rather than proof of work, and and therefore to uh, to be uh, much less uh, uh, energy heavy. Thank you. I see raised hands as was coming again, just to check that you have another question. Martin Sanbu, did you want to come in with another question? Or is it from earlier? I think it's from earlier. Okay. Thank you very much. I see Colin Post has raised a hand from the block. Colin, can you call in your question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I am curious now regarding, you know, cryptocurrencies a la Bitcoin, but more global stable coins uh, in the relationship between CBDCs and global stable coins. That seems like there's no way for those two not to be in direct competition. I mean, if a stable coin is not in some way skirting capital controls or KYC, uh, why would it be able to be uh a CBDC, why would it be able to exist in the same market? And, you know, if that is the case, why would a government issuing a CBDC tolerate its continued existence? Okay, Hyun, thank you. Yes, Joe, why don't I kick off and, and, and Benoit will come in. Um, uh, I think the, um, uh, with stable coins, um, you know, they are, uh, you know, payment instruments where, where you have a you have an asset backing. Um, uh, there are issues to do with you know whether it's a uh, a multi currency backing or whether it's a you know single um, currency denominated backing and so on. I think the important point is that um, uh, for a system to function well, um, uh, there has to be a kind of you know public good nature. Uh, and a very important part of that is the interoperability, uh, you know, between systems, uh, where uh, we guard against having, uh, you know, data silos and uh, walled gardens that lead to closed networks, uh, where you would not have the, the ability to to go across networks. So I think um, um, one thing to bear in mind is whether the introduction of a stable coin would lead to a fragmentation of the monetary system. Uh, or whether it can be, you know, incorporated more broadly and uh, uh, be incorporated as part of an open uh, system where everyone follows the same rules, uh, in particular the, you know, the data governance rules. And I think that question is still um, still open, uh, but I think we know enough about the the broad principles that give rise to uh, payment system that serve the public interest that, uh, you know, we, uh, I think, will be clear on the question that would be, you know, asked in that context. Um, I, I would just like to add that what, uh, what you call competition, I would call it choice for the customer. Uh, and, and so if you go, uh, 
if you go out uh, after after this press conference and, uh, and 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 buy a beer, uh, presumably you will have to choose between cash and uh, and your credit card or maybe your mobile phone, um, and that's okay. I mean, there is plenty of room for different choices to be made depending on the on the on the convenience of the interface, depending on the cost structure. Uh, how much will uh, will the, the merchant be charged? How much will you be charged? Uh, and so on and so forth. And that's exactly the kind of choice uh, that uh, we want to preserve when uh, when talking about CBDC. So you could you could you could envisage a world where uh, you will have a wallet on your mobile phone, and um, and either you have two wallets, one with a stable coin and one with CBDC, or maybe the same wallet where you have CBDC and a stable coin, and you can choose, and that's okay, uh, provided that the stable coin is properly uh, regulated as a as a means of payment, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, Martin Sandbu has been in touch to say he does indeed have a question. So, Martin, if you can unmute, we'd take your question now. And thanks, a conscious thanks. of time, time after this, we can take one more question. I think Mark Jones has his hand up again. And after that, I think we're, we're right on the clock. So, Martin, please go ahead. Thank, thanks very much. I wasn't unmuted before, so I couldn't answer that. It was indeed an, another question. I wanted to follow up on the question, a few questions back. Uh, Benoit talked about uh, uh, how you could make a currency exchange uh, smoother on a single platform, and and it struck me that the the benefits of that are greater for for the countries or the currencies that currently have less liquid markets in the current system, which means smaller economies, uh, in particular, currency pairs that don't go via one of the big currencies. Uh, and I just wanted to generalize that and ask in general how you see um, the sort of systematic differences in how all the considerations you, you point out apply to small and large economies, both in your own thinking and with your member central banks uh, without naming any jurisdictions. Can you say something about whether there's a pattern in how smaller jurisdictions or smaller currency areas and bigger ones are thinking about this? Thank you very much. Actually, Martin, let me start, and uh, and and I'm sure Benoit wants to uh, come in as well. I think the um, the important thing to bear in mind is that um, uh, the international use of uh, CBDCs, or, in, or indeed any uh, you know currencies in whatever form, um, you know, very much uh, depend on the underlying economic transactions. So I think we should we should not think of the payment system as somehow floating free separately from the underlying economic transactions. Um, and, and to that extent, uh, I think the, the wider use of, you know, one currency internationally uh, have very much to do with the underlying economic benefits of, uh, uh, of using that currency for the, for the economic transactions. Um, and, uh, and so, um, you know, when we talk about currency substitution, for example, I think the, uh, the worry that somehow packaged with that kind of uh, debate is that somehow if you're small, um, you know, your currency will be somehow um, pushed out by the larger currencies uh, if they are found to be more, you know, uh, you know more convenient. I think that's, um, uh, I think that's really, um, uh, you know, more about the uh, the use of the uh, uh, of the currency more broadly um, uh, in connection with the underlying economic transactions, rather than simply the digital form, you know, of a particular currency. And uh, um, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, well, let me just uh, stop there, and I'm sure Benoit has some other thoughts on this. No, I, I just wanted to uh, to defer to the. Um, to the, the survey on CBDC that the BIS published uh, earlier this year, which um, which asks the same questions to different central banks, uh, um, and uh, and the answers are different. So the motivation for uh, studying CBDC or even uh, uh, building a CBDC are different between uh, advanced economies and emerging market economies, and and small open economies. And when you're a, a small emerging market economy. Uh, certainly, cost is very important. I mean, cross-border payments uh, uh, remain very costly, which is why the G20 uh, has put uh, so much emphasis on it. Um, and uh, and financial inclusion also is very important. I mean, uh, in in many emerging market economies, uh, um, more uh, more households have um, mobile phones uh, than they have bank accounts. 
And so uh, moving to a, to a wallet-based wallet currency uh, or means of payment uh, is a way to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to leapfrog and to, uh, and to extract the benefits of, uh, of, uh, of, of many, many households having mobile phones already. Um, and, and so you have these different considerations uh, 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 um, at play. Uh, and certainly the, uh, the efficiency gains uh, are um, more likely in the case of, uh, of small open economies. And so the, uh, the FX market uh, uh, argument that, that you, you were putting forward, Martin, is only one of them. Uh, there, are many, there are many other arguments. And, uh, and the convenience, costs, and speed of, of cross-border payments are an essential part um, of the discussion here. But then, as Hyun said, the, uh, the risks may also be higher in terms of uh, uh, currency substitution, uh, for instance. So the stakes are higher for small open economies, uh, which might be why uh, in, in, many play, in many cases, they've started studying CBDC before large advanced uh, economies. I mean, consider that the, the only two countries uh, in the world uh, have, uh, um, having a, a live CBDC today are the, the Bahamas and, the, uh, and, uh, and countries in the Caribbean. Uh, and these are small open economies. So it tells you a lot. The stakes are higher, and uh, and uh, it's uh, it's very important for them to be on top of that discussion. Thank you, Benoit. We're just out of time. Um, I did see um, Mark Jones with his hand up to ask a question for a long time. Mark, we can take your fi one final question if you want to call that in. Or Hi there, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. We can. Um, ju just a quick question. Obviously, the the idea that these could potentially be hacked in some way is a is an issue. I mean, what would be the safety net in that kind of situation, and, and how big is that risk? I guess. True. Suggest maybe uh, Hyun have a. Yes, Mark. I think the uh, as we also say in the chapter, uh, you know, security is going to be a very very important uh, feature of any payment system, and. Um, and to the extent that uh, uh, even the, the conventional payment system uh, relies very heavily on, uh, uh, on uh, keeping track uh, electronically of the transactions, I think the same point would apply there. Um, but needless to say, this is something that's uh, um, a very key part of the, of the, of the development of uh, um, the current payment system. Uh, I think it's uh, um, also worth saying that, uh, as I also mentioned in my opening remarks, that many of the, uh, the component technologies are ones that are tried and tested. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the underlying, um, uh, if you like, the sort of uh, the foundational technologies to do with cryptography, uh, you know, these go back uh, a long time to the 1970s even, public key cryptography and so on. And these technologies, uh, you know, are are everywhere. Um, uh, in fact, that's also the way that we have digital signatures, for example, these days, where, you know, you can prove who you are uh, by having a public key, uh, but then you prove who you are by uh, also providing a signature based on your private key. Uh, but you don't have to reveal that private key, uh, you know, when you when you prove who you are. Uh, now, that kind of cryptographic uh, method that's constantly being evolved, but uh, it's something that clearly has to keep pace with the uh, with the kinds of threats that uh, may also be out there. Um, but it's also an issue that's uh, that's already there with the conventional system. So there's nothing particularly new uh, with CBDCs, but that's not to minimise uh, the fact that we need to really uh, you know raise the game constantly. Thank you very much, Yun, and uh, we're definitely out of time now, so we, we'll stop there. Everybody, thank you very much for your questions and, and for your time today. Um, a reminder that the report and uh, this briefing, everything said of this, is embargoed um, until one o'clock um, tomorrow. Um, also a reminder that if you want to link the report to your articles, you'll find all the URLs um, in the embargo page. And uh, as you're aware, the remaining chapters of the uh, annual economic report and the annual report will be released uh, under embargo to you later this week. So for many of you, we'll have another conversation um, next Monday. So we look forward to talking to you again then. And as always, you can follow up with the communications team at press at bis.org if there are any supplementary questions. Thank you again and take care.